I've ordered these by uh, most liked, and then we're just gonna go through a whole bunch of them. I'll chop this video up and hopefully it's not too long. Consider this a solo podcast. I hope you guys are doing well. Hope you're probably doing better than me because I just wasted two and a half hours to try and attend weeklies today when it was sold out. So no high quality Blastoise testing, but I'm in a good mood. I'm in a caffeinated mood because I'm on my second iced coffee of the day. With that said, if you guys are looking to buy any Pokemon cards at all, feel free to check out the sponsor of this channel, Comfy Hobbies. You can use code SneakerTalk to save 5% off. The most liked question that came up to the top is by Azu Jaden. Is Little Dark Fury cool in real life? He seems pretty chill. And that is a fantastic question. And I'm really sorry to break it to you. But LDF is a totally chill guy. So if you ever meet him, you're gonna know that he's gonna be a a one of the homies. He, he's one of the homies. Yeah. <laughs> I had to try and gaslight you guys there for a little bit. Yeah, LDF's really cool. I usually like to interview him when I can, and he's always down for interviews whenever I ask him to. So shout out to LDF. We actually have a couple of collaboration um, ideas in the works. Shout out to you, Matt. Appreciate you, bro. The next question comes in from the Chappy Cage. If you could pick any Pokemon to get a really good card that you could build a competitive slash meta deck around, which Pokemon would it be? Oh, I love that question, the Chappy Cage. This is a lot of responsibility. I am going to give you two answers for this question. The first one being like a regular kind of Pokemon and then the second one is going to be a legendary. So if it was a regular type of Pokemon, I would love to see a world where Sand Slash, like maybe Sand Slash EX is a thing and that is super competitive and, and really, really good. It'll probably have a very unique kind of attack and ability and stuff like that, but yeah, I would love to have Sand Slash pop off. And the legendary of my choosing that I wish would be really competitive would have to be Ho-Oh. Uh, Pokemon Gold was my first ever game, and Ho-Oh is a special Pokemon to me. So I would love to see a Ho-Oh EX of some sort. Ho-Oh V was definitely a very underwhelming card. Next question comes in from Flock019. Do you think Greninja from the next set, I forgot what it's called about, it's a fighting type, will be good? Yes, Greninja EX is going to be busted. It is going to poss possibly, quite possibly be uh, the best deck in format. If not the best deck, it'll still be in, I think, the top five at the bare minimum. Maybe the top three. Um, yeah, if you guys don't know Know what Greninja EX does. Here's a look at it on screen right now. Pokemon uh, revealed the official artwork for the Special Illustration Rare about last week, and you guys went wild for it when I reposted it on social media. Um, not only is this going to be a collector's uh, dream card from the set, it's also going to be a competitive nightmare to deal with. It is a fighting type Pokemon that takes water type energy. This is going to be a huge, huge problem. Holy smokes. Uh, Maridon will officially be, like I could never even touch Maridon. If I thought Charizard was bad enough, now having a meta with Charizard and Greninja, Sorry, Maridon. Uh, I gotta, I gotta, I gotta switch it up. I can't do it. Next question comes in from Lux TCG. What are your goals for this year, and what are some things you'd like to improve, life or Pokemon related? All right, so uh, Pokemon related, I would love to hit a hundred thousand subscribers on this channel. If you want to help me get there, just hit that right button down below. Maybe tell a friend or two that likes Pokemon cards, even if they don't play the game. Maybe my content might get them uh, interested in it. And then my personal goals, I love to go. I love to get more jacked. I'm a pretty skinny guy so uh, getting back into a uh, disciplined gym routine is definitely on my to-do list along with a sleeping schedule fix because my sleeping schedule has been pretty whack. Other than that I want to be posting consistently on this channel and on my old main channel as well Sneaker Talk. The next question comes in from uh, I, that's probably just a generic random randomly user generator name but it says could you do something about Backscalibur variations such as Quaquaval EX? Yeah so Backscalibur has a really really uh, great synergy for a lot of water type Pokemon um, so if you're able to play Excalibur with a stage two water Pokemon or a Pokemon that takes water energies, you probably would be in a really good spot, I think like chemistry wise for the deck. One deck I've been play testing a lot and really working on it is a top contender for my Orlando uh, regional event is Blastoise CX and I've been playing it with Palkia. Um, however, I might want to try it with Backscalibur. It might seem unorthodox, but like you might, you might be thinking, hey Christian, at that point you should just be playing Shen Pao Backscalibur with Iron Hands. And honestly, that's probably why I haven't done it. Uh, but I might just do it for fun, see how that works out. It's not really a deck that's on anybody's radar. But yeah, Backscalibur has a... It, Backscalibur is probably one of the best Pokemon in the game right now in terms of like a stage two. It's just so, so good. You literally play Irida, and if you have a little baby backs on the board, you get to grow up and wreak havoc. Don Cook 5265 asks, what stage one electric type, not Flappy or electric, would you like to see a 
Dynamotor reprinted Anya. Dynamotor is an amazing ability. I think it's been in the game for different different uh, eras and stuff. Um, we lost it with Flaffy, of course, with the rotation hitting it pretty hard. Uh, but what stage, what, what Pokemon, what Pokemon would it be? Okay, not gonna lie, I'm looking at a list on my computer screen at a bunch of different like lightning type Pokemon. And I think if maybe like Megas make a comeback, I think if they make like main Magnetric or Main Trick, however you pronounce it, if that had like a Dynamotor and then went into like a Mega Evolution Magnetric, I think that'd be really crazy. I'd say Luxio, but they've already printed so many Luxios and there's a lot of really good Luxray cards, so that would probably be way too broken. Um, looking for a stage one is a little trickier to find. Honestly, in a perfect world, maybe Palmo gets it, but Palmo has been reprinted or printed a few times already, and there's like Palma with kind of like a Dynamotor ability already, which accelerates from the deck, so. I think Palma would be a fantastic option, um, but that might just be way too broken. But hey, with the way Power Creep works in the game, it, it honestly wouldn't surprise me if they did that in like a year's time. Next question comes in from Who's In Here 702. Cute dog, by the way, if that's your actual dog. Uh, what sleeves, dice, and deck boxes do you use? So personally, I use uh, I use a lot of different things. I'm not locked into one. Dragon Shield is one of the go-to ones. I think that's just because they sell them at a lot of stores too. Uh, they're typically high quality. I know a lot of people have had issues with their quality control for Dragon Shield. Um, but yeah, I use Dragon Shield in a various amount of different colors. Um, I often play with Pokemon sleeves from like Japan. For example, I'll use Japanese sleeves or Japanese Pokemon Center sleeves. So here's some of them. And then I put an overshield or a uh, double sleeve on top because if you don't, the sleeves are very easy to damage and get ruined and they just don't last as long. So I think you, if you want to play with like cool sleeves, you have to double sleeve them. And that goes for like ETB sleeves too. I use even like deck boxes from events. So this is the NAIC deck box from last year. I actually use the sleeves with it for my Meowskarada deck right here. And they're all over sleeved. And uh, I use the Dragon Shield Clear Outer Mat as my go-to for double sleeving decks. Would highly recommend it. Um, if you want to play with double sleeved cards, you're gonna wanna have a deck box that can handle, uh, handle it. Um, if your hands are small, it's probably gonna suck. Um, I have really big hands, so I can get away with it. And usually just starting the game off, shuffling it can be a little bit annoying, um, but after your first one or two turns, it becomes such a pleasure to shuffle and, and play with these uh, decks that have double sleeve uh, double sleeve on them. I'll, I'll prefer to play a deck that's double sleeve than not double sleeve. There's another brand I've recently uh, started to experiment with, which I really, really like. Dragon Shield does this like non-glare thing where it's on black sleeves only. But there's another brand called Game Genix, which is I think just like a generic, super cheap brand as well. Uh, I think it was like $7 got me 100 sleeves. And most recently I bought their sleeves and uh, yeah, like a hundred sleeves for like seven bucks Canadian. That's like what, four or five bucks US. My only complaint, like I, I used it for my Maridon deck. My only complaint is that the top doesn't go as high as Dragon Shield. They shuffle really nicely. It's a really nice feel to it. And a huge benefit is they actually are non-glare. So when I take deck profile photos, they don't glare up and make it super shiny and impossible to see. So Game Genix or Game Genix, fantastic so far from what I've seen. But yeah, Dragon Shield does make non-glare, but they're like $14 for for the 100 compared to $7 for Game Genix and they make them in every color. So um, yeah, if there's brands out there, Ultra Pro is really good too. Ultra Pro is really popular. Um, any sleeve, yeah, any sleeve brands, hit me up. Hit me up at the right price and we'll, we'll work some magic, baby. We need an official sleeve sponsor. That'd be kind of sick to have on the channel, right? Deck boxes, I just go for like whatever, honestly. We got like Ultra Pro ones, which are super cheap. I like to throw stickers on them um, from time to time. We got cool Pokemon themed ones. We got the Iono like premium ones. These are nice. We got like the boss's order ones. They're nice because like you have room to put extra stuff on the other compartment, like coins and stuff if you want to do that. I have like a leather um, leather Mewtwo one here as well. We've got the Chrome Heart stickers. I have, I, w I wouldn't recommend this one for playing, but we have this, which is pretty sick. This is a 25th anniversary um, wooden celebrations deck box. Oh, I also use uh, cool ones from Japan. Like we picked this one up in Japan. Uh, check out my Japan vlogs, by the way. We got this Palkia one as well from Japan. I bought the matching sleeves for these as well, which uh, I don't have on the deck anymore. We got Giratina as well. Uh, we got the Giratina with the matching sleeves. So if you want to leak to your opponent what you're playing, 
make sure you roll the die first and let them pick heads or uh, let them pick first or second or you pick first or second before you reveal the deck uh, the deck aesthetic because you're gonna leak what you're playing some of the time. Mr. Crazy Jerry 899 asks, will you build a Gengar EX deck? Would love to see your take on it. Yes, and in fact, since you asked so nicely, here's my current build for Gengar EX. Uh, would I recommend it? Not necessarily, I'm still tweaking and testing it, but you can use that as sort of a starting point. The Dark Rise are kind of optional. I think I like the Dark Rise a lot. It really, it really does feel good being able to reuse cards like Prime Catcher and Dark Patch on demand. Next question comes in from Sorcery2020. Do you think Espathor EX might be a good deck post rotation? If so, what are some recommendations to build one? This question was actually asked before EUIC and EUIC just went happened. And I do believe Espathor is a really good choice. It's actually in my top three decks to play for Orlando Regionals this weekend. Uh, so while we are here, I believe his name is Braden Alfred or Brandon Alfred. I think he got 24th place at EUIC with Espathra. Um, it's a really, really fun list. There's a couple different versions of Espathra you can play. Um, there's Espathras that have Mewtwo EX in it. There's Espathras that have Scizor, uh, Scizor in it. There's Espathras that have Vanette in it. Here is uh, the highest placing Espathra list of all time. Take a look at this list and uh, you might see me playing it at Orlando this weekend. Enderben102 asks, you've probably answered this question, but what are your thoughts on Maridon EX post rotation? Is it gaining any new cards in Temporal Forces? Also, is YouTube your job or do you have another job? Uh, so yeah, YouTube is my full job. I've been a YouTuber for about 15 years now. Maridon is pretty much like, Maridon lost Flaffy, which was really hard. It lost Peony, which is really hard. However, the deck is not horrible. The deck is not bad. It's not like a C tier deck by any means. I'd put it at a B tier deck. However, the biggest concern is that we're pretty much in a meta where it's 30% Charizard. And so if there's a one in three chance, you're gonna hit a matchup, which is almost an auto loss because we haven't really figured out a way to best counter Charizard. You're taking in, you're gonna lose like 30, you're gonna lose one third of your games just based off of the Charizard being the, the deck that you're playing against, which is not fun. Um, on top of that, we did lose one of our better uh, popular matchups, Gardevoir EX. Gardevoir is no longer as popular as it once was. Um, and so those freer matchups, those sort of easier matchups, um, they're not as easier to come by these days. However, I do think Maridon is a fantastic deck right now if you ignore Charizard, but you just can't ignore decks, right? Like if it's that popular and if it's the B DIF and a lot of people are going to play it, you're going to lose games to players who just play Charizard, even if they're not the best players. Even if you can try and skill diff them, Charizard is Charizard and Charizard is really, really good. If it wasn't for Charizard, I'd probably be playing Maridon a whole bunch more. And I've been playing Maridon locally and I just keep getting punished for it. Like I keep playing against Charizard's round one at like the last couple of events that I went to. Like the last three... Yeah, like three or four events. I just keep playing against Charizard round one. But yeah, there's different ways to build Maridon. You can build it uh, with like the way it used to have, but just like with a ton of tools. You can build Maridon with uh, Reggie Lucky VMAX. You can build Maridon with Magnazone, V-Star. There's a lot of ways to play it, but honestly, if you want to play Maridon or Iron Hands, just play Future Hands or Future Box. Play that deck instead. Much better matchup spread, much better, uh, maybe just much better deck in general. Play Future Box, play Future Hands. There's still Maride on there. It's just not an EX. You're, you're gonna you're gonna miss the tandem units, but you're also going to not miss instantly losing to Charizards all the time. And Iron Crown is weak to Dark, so if they do set up the Zard, it, 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 it becomes tricky. It becomes tricky. Next question comes in from a channel member. So shout out to Year of Shorty and your Tinkaton love. Where do you get your best playtesting done? And when cooking up a brand new deck, I haven't seen any deck list on it. Is the Pokemon the focus to the deck or the general playstyle slash archetype and slot in appropriate Pokemon? So first portion, where do you get your best playtesting done? I probably say I get my best playtesting done, um, honestly, just on my phone, just, just like are on my computer uh, playing games on the ladder. Um, because you can play a lot of games, you can quickly switch up your deck, you can um, you can see a lot of like the meta decks consistently as well on the ladder too. And then other than that, probably playing at local events, whether it be at Manta Trading, uh, Banana Games, Comfy, there's a lot of top players in the greater Toronto area. So playing locally is usually um, the best way to get playtesting done, especially if you have friends, like in a friend group. Um, but I think the the best playtesting quality games IRL I have are usually at Manta Trading because of the quality of players there consistently, and then online as well. 
So uh, yeah, and the next question is, when cooking up a brand new deck that hasn't really seen any deck list uh, on, um, what's the focus? My focus would generally be on a mixture of the Pokemon and then the supporters, and then I kind of go from there. Um, certain decks, you know, you can kind of have like a, a, a shell based off of previous decks in the format. You can think about the different engines for, for draw engines. You can like, all right, you could be like, oh, there's a Pidgeot engine, there's a Barrel engine, there's a Zatu engine if you're a Psychic type deck. So you want to think about, I guess, the general engines for the deck. Maybe that's a good place to start and see how that will synergize with the particular Pokemon you plan to play with. And then, of course, you want to log in the supporters or the item cards that best suit that type of deck. Dark Pokemon, Dark Patch. You're playing uh, water Pokemon, you're going to have Irida in there. So there's certain things that you can always assume are going to be in a particular deck based off of the Pokemon that is going to be the, 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 the front and center focus of the deck. Smoad 9567 asks, how do you tech against other meta decks like Charizard? I'm a Lugia V-Star slash Encino player. Love your videos. So apparently, I, I don't know, I, I'm not sure how the Charizard Lugia matchups go. So I, I probably can't give you ideas about how to tech for Lugia versus Charizard, but you really have to look at what your deck is good at and what does it lack in, and then what is that other deck good at and what could it, what it is, what is its weakness? Not necessarily like weakness in typing, but like weakness. So for example, Charizard decks, now they're playing a lot more Turos and, and switching cards to play against control and whatnot. Uh, and play around those style of decks. But like a lot of Charizard decks had six to seven um, energies for fire and not really many switch outs. So if you had ways to punish them for their sort of greedy counts of not having so much energies, you can really uh, punish them. You can, you can do things like item lock them. One tech card I wanna consider for yourself to put into your decks and a lot of your other decks going forward is Eerie. Eerie is really, really good. Being able to see your opponent's hand and then also discard uh, up to two items is a fantastic card. So if you don't have to be aggressive with your supporter, Eerie is definitely more of one of those defensive kind of supporters, which really disrupt your opponent and could put you in a really great board state. Sephiroth39 asks, what is the best way to get better at the Pokemon TCG and what should you be thinking about during the match? I think the best way to get better at the Pokemon TCG is whether you win or lose a match, reflect on it and think about what you could have done better and what you could have changed. Always learning from your previous matches is the best way. If you're able to watch other people play at a high level as well, watching streamed matches either from the official Pokemon regional events and stuff like that or from top players like Azul GG, uh, getting to see how they have their outlook on the game while they play and go through their turns is really helpful. Also, not just playing one deck, playing uh, like maybe the top five decks in the game is really, really helpful because not only will you have the knowledge of how to play those decks if you do want to play those decks to a tournament, but you'll also have a better understanding of the fundamentals of those decks and what kind of lines of plays and, and how they want to operate. So you can kind of be one step ahead of them. For example, I don't really play, uh, I don't really play Golden Go, but if I wanted, if I'm struggling against Golden Go, you should play the Golden Go deck itself to see why the deck is good and where the weak points are. So you can isolate those and build your deck accordingly when you play against it. I like to think of Pokemon as like a flow chart and then you kind of see the different ways the game flows. If you go Bidoof in the active and Squirtle, what changes? If you go Squirtle in the active and Bidoof, what changes? Um, so just trying to be one step ahead of your opponent at all times. That's where deck knowledge and experience really comes in handy. Um, but what you might lack in skill and play time, you can always uh, get paid. You could pay for tutoring. Uh, there's a lot of people who do tutoring in the Pokemon TCG. I'm not one of them right now that does it. I've been offered it by Metafy, but it's not something I really want to do at the moment. I want to get better before I start taking people's money to help them get better. But if I were to offer coaching, it would have to be for like very particular decks. I, I'd, I'd, I'd probably be better off my time spent streaming with you guys or just making videos for now. But yeah, that was a very long answer. So I hopefully you got some value out of that one. Zamont720 asked, are there any decks slash cards from Twilight Masquerade you are looking forward to trying. I really haven't looked into too, too much about Twilight Masquerade to be honest with you, uh, but the cards that do come to mind instantly are or is Iron Thorns EX. I'm a huge, huge sucker for Tyranitar and uh, Tyranitar EX was kind of underwhelming, so hopefully Iron Thorns EX can uh, pick up the slack. It looks really good. 
Um, if you're a future box player or just want to play a Iron Thorns DX like as the, the main thing in the deck, uh, yeah, Iron Thorns looks fantastic. Council for Shenanigans asks, what advice do you have for a casual player when it comes to league level tournaments? So when you say league level tournaments, I'm assuming just like your regular weekly league, they're not too sweaty at like a challenge or a league cup. Um, so just your casual player base. I would say try and get better at prize checking. Usually prize checking is the one skill that um, is a huge, huge factor when it comes to games, especially if you have a teched out list or there's just particular cards. Knowing what cards are at your availability during the game is a huge, huge advantage. And it is a skill that you can improve on week after week, tournament after tournament. Other than that, I would say um, always go into the tournament with a fun student mindset. You're looking to learn, you're looking to improve your decks. Maybe you're not looking to win the full tournament, but if you're able to uh, improve your deck tournament after tournament, or at, at least get better with when it comes to your sequencing and stuff like that, that's always a really good thing too. Mini Bex 5258 I still have hopes for the Miascarada deck. Love your videos, your tournament videos are especially helpful. Hope you've been doing well. Uh, thank you, Mini Bex. So, uh, yeah, I really want Miascarada to work. It's actually the most requested deck from you guys. So, we are going to start a series, hopefully soon, called Miascarada Mondays, where we just focus in on Miascarada every single week, week after week, continue to evolve the deck, uh, and also consider your feedback as well uh, for the deck. So, in the comments, uh, if you guys are playing Miascarada, I want to get your feedback on how you're playing it, what changes you guys are making, what uh, strengths and weaknesses are that you guys see in the meta, uh, stuff like that. So Miascarada is a top of mind deck. Um, I'd like to play it at some point at a high competitive level, but just finding out that perfect 60 or even 55 or 56 is a, it's been a struggle. Matthew Hill Kent PTCG asks, after being a Maridon one trick for most of last season, do you, do you see yourself sticking to Maridon and playing variations of the deck come post format? Or do you see yourself starting to expand your choice of decks to play as rotation took away some cards from our pool and Temporal Forces cards have shifted the metagame and brought many new decks to life, our old decks back to life. Curious what your thoughts are. So yeah, I, I would definitely say I was a Maridon one trick last, or at least for this current season. Um, I did get points with Gengar VMAX. I did get, I still have points actually with Gear, uh, Lost Giratina. Um, and even with Alakazam, I got points with Alakazam. I honestly just can't keep playing Maridon if Charizard becomes so dominant. Playing on hard mode if I put myself in that position. So we're gonna have to rest the dawn and keep trying other things. I do have experience playing a lot of other decks, but most of my success has been seen with Maridon. But I try and prove it to you guys that I actually am a, a good player. I can play other decks like Lost Tina well. I can play Blastoise well. I can play Alakazam well. So I perform well with other decks. Um, but yeah, Maridon was just definitely my like comfort pick and my go-to uh, for for farming championship points and whatnot and doing well at tournaments. So without Maridon, it feels a little a little different, but it's a it's a good different. I'm having fun in the new format even without Maridon by my side. Juan Vargas Arts asks, "What's the best way to prepare for a regional?" Well. Uh, great question, and if you guys want to get more tips, like really, really insightful tips for Pokemon tournaments in general, I did a deep video about Pokemon tournament tips, so I'll leave a link down below or as a pop-up card at the end of this video. I would highly recommend it. It is I put a lot of work into it, so yeah, check that video out if you want more tips for tournaments. Uh, but the best tips for regionals, just to give you some some quick ones, is uh, try and lock in your top three decks the week before the tournament. Um, and then really, really get to know those decks, play those decks a whole bunch to see what works well in the current meta online or in person. Make sure you know those decks pretty much in and out, through and through, and uh, get some sleep. Sleep is a huge, huge buff if you can get it before a tournament. Brian Caspel, 9538 asks, if someone is going to their first Pokemon regional or other large tournament, what should they bring with them besides their deck? Uh, again, this is another kind of question I answer in the deep, deep tips video, but I'm gonna just tell you right now, snacks and food food and a portable battery for your phone in case you have low uh, low battery. So those are some some definitely good ones. Oh, and extra sleeves. Bring extra sleeves. Next question comes in from Noah. A fun question for a vid is playing a jank deck, i.e. playing something unconventional bad. I'm sure as a person who plays Pokemon as a full-time job, there's a lot of pressure for a lot of pressure to not play a fun deck or put the hours in on a fun deck, but your perspective would be nice. Um, 
I play jank decks all the time. I play Blastoise, I play Alakazam, uh, I play a lot of fun decks. Um, but the half the fun there is making the deck work and having it beat the meta. Um, usually jank decks are considered bad because they're off meta and they're usually off meta because they're bad. Uh, but yeah, if you can get your personal pet deck working, it feels absolutely amazing. But yeah, I honestly don't really feel that pressure to play a top meta deck. If I did, I'd probably be playing Charizard a whole bunch. But then here I was playing Maridon for over a year. Um, I was playing Maridon before it was meta. I was playing Maridon when it was considered bad. I was playing Maridon when we didn't have Iron Hands. I've been a huge fan of Maridon, whether it was meta or not. Same for when I was playing Zacian, but I was not seriously playing when I was playing Zacian back then. I play way too much Pokemon, so uh, so yeah, even if I'm playing jank decks, I'm, I'm finding a way to make those jank decks work. And that's one of the fun things I like to do with this channel is to prove to you guys that you can win with your favorite Pokemon. You can win with Blastoise, you can win with Alakazam, you can win with Meowskarada. It's not impossible, uh, but you definitely have to put in extra hours because uh, you have to figure out ways to make those decks work. Yu Yu Young 3433, I uh, probably pronounced that wrong. Um, they asked, what do you think will be the best meta deck? Uh, will any new EXs be good that are coming up? What deck will you play after rotation? Are you staying with Maridon? All the usual questions. Okay, Charizard, BDIF, still BDIF, undisputed. Uh, yeah, next up, I think Shen Pao is crazy, crazy good. Shen Pao with Iron Hands. Insanely, insanely good deck. It's easy to learn and play. However, the skill ceiling is very, 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 very high. Uh, it has a really great matchup spread across the board, and it has a solid matchup into Charizard, which is the best deck and most played deck at the moment. Other EXs that are good coming up, obviously we talked about it earlier, Greninja EX is going to be broken. I think Espathra is heavily underrated, and this question was asked before uh, EUIC. I, I did expect at least one Espathra to pop off and do really well. Team Vikavolt2856 asked, I'm curious how you went about gaining a sponsorship with a local game shop, and if you think more local game shops ought to create TCG teams of their own. I think every local game shop should have a team of their own. I think it's really awesome uh, being able to represent a store, kind of like a, a home base, especially if that store is really special to you and that's maybe one of your goals and aspirations. Not all stores do, but a lot of them have started too. Sponsorship levels will vary based off of what the stores are able to uh, to do, because like every store has a budget, right? And basically having a team is basically just like a marketing budget in a sense, and different stores sponsor different players for different reasons. For myself, how I went about getting sponsored was I just started performing insanely well for about four to five weeks of playing. I consistently top forward uh, multiple events every single week for like five, six weeks. Um, I also have a following online, of course, so that definitely does help. It gives me leverage because there's extra eyeballs on me. So not only are you are you like paying for a player uh, that is performing well, but even if they're not performing well, you still want eyeballs, right? You still want eyeballs, you still want uh, the store to get noticed. A couple of stores hit me up in the same week uh, to to reach out for potential sponsorships and we ended up going with Comfy Hobbies. So again, shout out to Comfy Hobbies, use code SneakerTalk for 5% off. But if you wanna get sponsored, just put in work, do really well, and if you're not doing well, you have another reason to get sponsored. Maybe, maybe you're a very friendly, popular person in your community where a lot of people will um, enjoy the content you post. Uh, but if you're also not posting content at all, then they have less of a reason to sponsor you, right? But if you're gonna not post much, you're gonna have to make up for that with your amazing skill level. So there's some like crazy crack players out there who just don't post too much. There's different reasons to sign different players. For me, my selling points are I have a following on social media, so whatever team I represent is going to get some definite eyeballs for whatever reasons they might want them for. And then I am a above average player, so you can at least have some some uh, some safety knowing that I'm going to at least show up and perform at a majority of the events that I attend. Voice Inc. 5267 asks, what type would Dragon hit for weakness and if none, why? Um, yeah, I think none is fine and I think the fact that Dragon has no weakness is also fine. Uh, a lot of dra all the Dragon Pokemon pretty much have like some weird obscure energy requirements. So that's kind of like the weakness or the difficulty in itself uh, making those dragon decks kind of work and actually be playable. The attacks that they have when they do work out are usually very strong. Therefore, if it were to have hitting for weakness as a bonus thing, that would be just be way too broken. So I think what they've done with the dragon type Pokemon right now in the Pokemon trading card game is very 
balanced. Whether you like, if it, maybe that's a hot take, but I think the way they have Dragon Pokemon done right now are, is fine, it's fair. Inky underscore manga says, please more Japan vlogs. Inky, I'm working on it. I wanna post these Japan vlogs I've been sitting on for over a year, but I'm just so behind on the current content. So once I get caught up, there's gonna be Japan vlogs. And best of all, there's gonna be a lot more eyeballs to watch those Japan vlogs too. So we're sitting on some, but if you've missed my Japan vlogs, uh, check out the Japan vlogs playlist in my description or channel page. And you can also go to my old channel where I have like 80 Japan vlogs as well. So check out my, check out my old channel. Sneaker talk. <laughs> Sock Hosk asks, if you could reprint any one card, what would it be? That would that would have to be a very easy uh, <laughs> Dino Motor Flaffy answer for you right there. Jedo Defunct 8 asked, how is it practicing slash training for Pokemon TCG tournaments? Even better, how did you grow with the competitive landscape over time? I'm a newish player and want to play more competitively and your content always inspires me to work hard. Hey, that's awesome to hear. Thanks for watching. I really appreciate it. Um, how, what is it like practicing for training for Pokemon TCG tournaments? It just cons consists of lots and lots of playing. So just playing on your phone a whole bunch, playing on your computer a whole bunch. And if you're not able to play, just watching Pokemon on content is another great way because maybe you're like on a commute going to school or going to work or you're just not in a position to where you can play if you're just consuming Pokemon content that's a really great way along with studying deck list um, I really enjoy spending hours in that this is so nerdy I enjoy studying deck list whether it's J Japanese list from city leagues and just other uh, Japanese events to random online events to regional tournaments I love looking at deck list learning what decks are trying to do, uh, what they're teching in, what they're also taking out, teching in, taking out. Uh, yeah, just how the decks are shaping up over time. And also there are so many top players in the trading card game that have YouTube channels like Rowan Stavino, like Kieran Farah. There's a lot of top players that have a lot of podcasts as well. If you got adult money and you want to fast forward your success in the game, I would definitely recommend coaching from a top player. Knox 14 asks, what did you do when you started your channel and what would you say helped you grow the most? Okay, so uh, let me see my anniversaries here real quick. My main channel that I I'm not really active on these days uh, called Sneaker Talk. That channel is turning 10 years old on October 25th. And then Sneaker Talk TCG, the channel you're watching right now, ooh, voice crack, uh, it's turning four years old October 24th. No relation, but their, their birthdays are one day off. So this channel is turning four years old this year. And I would say the thing that helped me to grow the most is consistency. Consistency and also putting out good, like I don't want to uh, pat myself on the back too hard, but I would say, putting out quality content and really spend time like ideating content. I think content ideation, like the actual ideas of the videos are super important. Not many people are putting out IRL Pokemon tournament vlogs. This is a niche that I kind of have a lock on right now and I'm more than excited to see more people tap into it because uh, people want to see that content. Also doing cool fun things like making booster boxes of prize packs. That's a cool idea. So make cool ideas, put out cool content, uh, or just have a twist on, on regular kind of videos that people are putting out there. But Pokemon is a very heavily saturated market and YouTube is very saturated in general. The barrier to entry to become a social media influencer or a content creator in general has never been lower. It's so easy to become, um, to, to get into it but to actually excel at it is very hard. If you don't know, only 1% of videos hit 10,000 viewers or more on YouTube. So if you're hitting 10K viewers or more, you're literally part of the 1%. Variant asks, are you coming to Europe to any events? Would love to meet you in person. Not this season, unfortunately, since EUIC just finished, but next season, I would love to go over to Europe uh, for a couple events, definitely for EOIC next year. Two more questions before we wrap up this video. So uh, we got Pokefan05 asking, how long have you been playing the game? Personally, you've been playing since late XY. Uh, I've been playing since around Champion's Path release, so about three years-ish, uh, like the fall of 2020 during COVID. And I'd say I personally started playing like actually competitively this last year. This has been my like full year now uh, actually really, really trying and, and trying to call for worlds, for example, playing, I guess, meta decks and being more observant about everything going on rather than just going in with your fun rogue deck and playing and, and just not even caring if you win or lose the tournament. It's like, now I go to tournaments every single time trying to win it all. Before it was like, I'm just gonna go to have some fun, you know? The final question comes in from Mega Blitz. What Pokemon do you wish had more cards printed of itself, special arts and overall attention in the trading card game? And I got a fun question or fun 
some fun answer for you. My answer is I actually, I'm not gonna single out a particular Pokemon or a style of Pokemon, but I wish Pokemon would actually print day two promo cards or top 128, top 160, top 100, top 64 promo cards. The game has been growing at this insane, insane rate. The tournaments have been getting are getting bigger and bigger. It is quite expensive to attend a lot of these events, especially regularly. I feel like if Pokemon showed the love that I think the community deserves, which is special day two stamped promo cards or maybe a cool mat for getting day two at an event because they're just so big, they're so hard to get day two. And then also maybe top 64 because they they finally increased the pricing this year just to really adjust for inflation, that was it. Um, I would love to see more prizing, including promo cards uh, for, for high performing or at least really strong performances at tournaments. That way um, the players have more to play for, there's a souvenir that they can get or they can sell to kind of like recoup their money as well um, but yeah that's it I appreciate you guys hanging out with me for another fun long video and I'll catch you guys in the next one so click on screen to hang out some more or uh, yeah see you maybe tomorrow peace out